All right, welcome back for lecture number two. Uh, this one is going to be the continuation of the first lecture. This one is just called After First Contact. It's kind of a look at what's happening after Europeans start coming to North America. And I think the first place you have to start is just getting an idea of how these explorations happened. Uh, the first people who are going to do exploring really are going to be the Portuguese. Now, I know today a lot of people can't pick out Portugal on a map. Um, spoiler, it's the little country that's attached to Spain. But at one point in time, Portugal was the most powerful country in the world. It was the richest. It controlled the gold trade. It controlled the slave trade. It was the, the country, Portugal, that was really in charge of what was happening in Europe. Now, why did this happen? Well, uh, long story short... In the early 1000s, there were a series of wars known as the Crusades. And the Crusades happened between Christian forces and Islamic forces, Muslim forces, over who would control the Holy Land. Well, when those wars broke out, the trade routes that went through the Middle East, going to places like China and India, they broke down and Europeans were no longer welcome or allowed to go through this contested area that's today the Middle East. So Europeans decided that they wanted to try and get to India and China on their own. So they start exploring. And the Portuguese are going to start sailing south along the coast of Africa. They're going to figure out how to get around Africa and into the what is today the Indian Ocean, and eventually people like Vasco da Gama are going to make it all the way to India. But along the way, the Portuguese are going to realize in Africa that they can make some money and they can get some trade. So these Portuguese are going to stop in Western Africa. They're going to discover an ongoing slave trade and they're going to introduce themselves to it. So African leaders are going to get European supplies, like guns and metals and things like that. And Europeans are going to get people and gold. Now, with this, the Portuguese are going to gain complete control of the gold trade, complete control of the slave trade. And that's going to occur for several hundred years. One really big thing about the slave trade that people need to know is that African slave trade, it was happening, but it was completely different than what it develops into. Uh, in the African slave trade, uh, most slaves are going to be protected legally. They're going to be allowed to have families. Their children are not slaves, meaning it's not a perpetual thing. Um, and there's also going to be a pathway to freedom. European slavery, on the other hand, is going to be based on race. It's going to be based on the idea of control, and it's perpetual. If you're a slave, all of your descendants will be slaves, too. In the African slave trade, you became a slave usually because you were in debt, or you have broken the law, or maybe you were given away as a gift. Yes, that did happen. Or last but not least, you're a prisoner of war. Your side fought a war and lost. European slavery was just because you were, you were black or white or from Africa or from Europe. Uh, so the Portuguese, is, the Portuguese are basically going to recreate and reimagine how slavery works. Now, there are some African kings who are going to use this slave trade to their benefit. They're going to use the slave trade to increase their power, increase their wealth, get rid of dissidents, people that are causing them trouble. Some of these African kings are going to um, you know, take over other, I don't want to say civilizations, but other cultures and dominate. So... The idea of this European slave trade and how big it got is going to completely change the African landscape. I'm, and I'm talking like complete collapse of societies and everything else. Um, another thing that's not talked about often is that there wasn't just one slave trade. There were two slave trades going on in Africa 
involving people leaving the continent. The European slave trade took somewhere around uh, 15 to 20 million people out of Africa, but there was also a slave trade going east to places like India and what is today the Middle East, where another 15 to 20 million people left the country or left the continent there too. So just know that the African slave trade was huge. Uh, moving on to the people who are a little bit more familiar with us are these Spanish explorers. Um, usually Christopher Columbus is the first name people think of. Well, um, I hope I don't crush your hopes and dreams here, but Columbus did not discover America. Columbus was actually one of the final explorers to get here, and Christopher Columbus never realized he was in North America. Uh, he thought he was in the islands off the coast of China. Now, the reason for this, uh, when Christopher Columbus was hired by the king and queen of Spain to do some exploring, he had a map with him known as Ptolemy's map. Uh, Ptolemy was a Greek or a Roman map maker. He had no idea North and South America existed, and so they weren't on his map. And according to Ptolemy's map, you could sail to the west from Europe and get to China. Well, Christopher Columbus, he gets on his ships, he sails to the west according to this map, and he runs into land. He thinks he's in China. Where was he really? He was in the Bahamas, but he never knew that. Uh, one thing Christopher Columbus does do is he discovers and maps out all of the major islands, Puerto Rico, uh, Hispaniola, the Bahamas, Cuba, Jamaica, and then he exploits the people. He basically plants the Spanish flag and does whatever he wants with the people. Uh, and there's lots of death, lots of destruction. Columbus actually made, I think it's five visits to America. And at the end of one of his voyages, he's actually sent back to Spain in handcuffs because of how bad he's treating the people. Another group of Spanish explorers, they're known as the conquistadors. This is going to be Cortez, Pizarro, um, uh, um, Ponce de Leon. And each of these conquistadors, they're going to come here to the Americas for personal gain. Uh, Cortez is going to come to Central America. He's going to find the Aztec Empire because he's searching for gold. And he's going to completely defeat the Aztec Empire in the year 1519. Uh, the Aztecs weren't very well liked by their neighbors. Something about warfare and, and uh, human sacrifice that make you an enemy. And so when Cortez shows up in, in Mexico, a lot of the enemies of the Aztecs are going to help Cortes defeat the Aztec Empire. In South America, you've got Francisco Pizarro. Pizarro is going to land on the north coast of where uh, Venezuela is today. And he's going to discover that the Inca Empire is in the middle of a civil war. The Sapa Inca, the leader of the Inca, has just died. His two sons are going to fight for the throne, and Pizarro decides to help one son defeat the other son. Well, when the one son wins the war, Pizarro is going to defeat him. And the way the Inca Empire was set up, if you cut off the top, if you cut off the head, so to speak, the rest of the body is going to die. So it only takes four years for the Inca Empire to be defeated by Pizarro, and the Incas were the strongest civilization that North America had ever seen up to that point. All just to find some gold and silver. Ironically, when the gold and silver is discovered in Central and South America, it's all spent, it's all sent back to Spain and it uh, collapses the Spanish economy. There's so much gold and so much silver that floods Spain, money becomes worthless, people can't afford to eat, inflation goes through the roof, and Spain doesn't even get to keep any of the money. They have to pay their own bills with it. So what did the Spanish do? Well, they set up permanent civilizations. They set up permanent missions, which are a type of church. And they set up colonies. And these colonies are going to be tightly regulated. And the Spanish missionaries, the, they're going to attempt to seek out and destroy native cultures and convert everybody to 
Catholicism and make them follow a Catholic lifestyle. There are some northern traders. I mean, there are some French, there are some Dutch coming over. The Swedish are going to come over here. Um, even before that, you get Vikings who come here and establish a couple of settlements in Canada. But for the most part, these northern traders, they're just coming here to make money. They're coming here to get furs, get fish. They don't make any large scale settlements. Uh, you know, I've got the biggest cities listed here, Quebec, Montreal, St. Louis, and New Orleans. Those are all originally French cities. And the Catholic Church would send over missionaries to these northern areas, and they would live amongst the Native Americans and learn a little bit about their lifestyle and try to gently convert them to Christianity where the Spanish were forcing people. So it's a slightly different view these northern traders took versus you know, the Portuguese and the Spanish. Now the last slide I've got for you here, this is called the Columbian Exchange. And this is the transfer, both intentional and unintentional, of biological materials between Europe and the Americas. And there are some things that we take for granted and look at every day that you may not realize were part of this Columbian Exchange. Um, potatoes. I mean, French fries are everywhere. Potatoes were originally from the Andes, the mountains of South America, and they were taken to Europe where they grew very well in places like Ireland and England and northern Germany. And potatoes became a very important crop throughout the world. <coughs> Corn is something that we use every day. If you drive a car or if you ride in a car, ethanol is in our gasoline and ethanol is made from corn. If you are drinking out of a plastic bottle, we can make plastic from corn today. Uh, food has corn syrup in it and then of course you can just eat corn too. Uh, corn was originally from Central America. It was brought back to Europe, it grew very well, and it became the food that fed most of Europe because it's so efficient. And then finally, tomatoes. Um, tomatoes were originally from Central America, and they were known as a golden apple because Europeans had never seen anything like it before. And tomatoes become a staple of Italian food, pizza, elementary schools. Just imagine a world without pizza or Italian food or ketchup. Well, we have the Colombian Exchange to thank for that. Another part of this Colombian Exchange is sugar. Uh, sugar is discovered in Central America. It's discovered to grow very well in the Caribbean. And Europeans develop a sweet tooth. And so these large sugar plantations are going to be created. And to work on these sugar plantations, uh, large numbers of slaves are going to be brought in. And the bigger the sugar plantations, the more slaves. The more slaves, the bigger they make these sugar plantations. And it becomes this vicious cycle. Uh, drinks are going to be part of this Columbia Exchange. Tea, coffee, chocolate. Um, tea is originally from India and China. And it becomes a European drink. It's discovered to, to grow well in South America and Central America. And tea is going to become a worldwide beverage because of the British. You have... Um, the British East India Trading Company. We're going to talk about that when we get to uh, British colonialism. The British East India Trading Company. What was it trading? It was trading tea around the world. And tea, I know this might sound like I'm making it up, but tea is what actually creates the British Empire. Because wherever the tea goes, wherever the British go, um, their military follows. Coffee is going to be discovered to grow very well in northern Africa, in the Middle East, and eventually it's going to be brought to South America. Coffee is seen as an acceptable drink in Islamic Muslim faith. Uh, in a traditional Muslim is not allowed or is not supposed to drink alcohol. And coffee is going to be a stimulant that can alter the mind that is okay. 
Well, coffee is going to help create the British Empire. Coffee is a worldwide drink today and grown in large numbers in Central America and in Brazil. Finally, chocolate. Uh, chocolate was originally a medicinal drink from Central America and Europeans fall in love with chocolate and now chocolate is everywhere. Vending machines, probably your pocket, you name it. Um, slaves are a part of this Columbia exchange because the people are taken out of Africa and spread throughout the world. And then last but not least, you got diseases. Um, smallpox, influenza, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, the, the common cold. Those were all diseases that were common in Europe, but had not been seen in North or South America. And when Europeans come to North South America, they're going to bring all these diseases with them. And in some cases, there's going to be a 90%, 90 90%, 90% death rate amongst local populations because they have absolutely no protection against these European diseases. Uh, there is one disease that goes back to Europe from the Americas and that's syphilis. Uh, syphilis is of course an STD. I'll let you figure out how that disease got back to Europe, but that is really the only disease that was not seen in Europe that came from the Americas. So uh, once again, very short video. Um, this is kind of you know, what happens once the groups start mixing. And in the next lecture for next week, we'll start talking about how Britain starts to do their colonization, how we get closer to, you know, the American Revolution. So once again, thanks for joining. Nice and short video. We'll see you next time.